From the Internet Law and Policy Foundry, this is the Tech Policy Grind podcast. Every week, our fellows chat with leaders in the technology and internet law and policy space on recent developments and exciting topics such as privacy, internet governance, cybersecurity, tech legislation, and more. I'm your host, Rima Musa, and I'm a member of the fourth cohort of Foundry Fellows. The Foundry is a collaborative organization for internet law and policy professionals who are passionate about disruptive innovation. Hello and welcome to Internet Law and Policy Founders discussion on privacy in the metaverse. My name is Mary Bagdasarian and today I have the pleasure to moderate the discussion together with my colleague Rima Musa. For those who don't know the Foundry, it is a collaborative organization for internet law and policy professionals who are passionate about disruptive innovation. Each year, the Foundry fellows, such as Rima and myself, organize various events and discussions. This event is the second in our series of events related to the metaverse, leading up to our third annual policy hackathon, which will be held, held later this October. Applications to participate in the hackathon have been released and will be open until September 23rd. We are also hosting a writing competition and we'll post the links about this amazing opportunities. So today we're discussing all things privacy, uh, one of the widely debated and most important issues in tech policy currently. To discuss a myriad of issues around privacy in the metaverse, we have a stellar panel of experts, namely Sasha Danielian, who is an associate product counsel at Niantic, Katica Rodriguez, policy director for global privacy at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and Libby Weingarten, privacy and cybersecurity partner at Wilson Sansini. Without further ado, I'll pass it on to Riemann to kick off our conversation. Thank you so much, Mary, and thank you, Sasha, Libby, and Katica for being here for this panel. Really excited to dig into the conversation. So to get us started, I want to ask, what is the metaverse? How does it work? Maybe we'll start with Katica. Could you give us an overview of what the metaverse is, um, how it came about, and where it is now? And then we'll go to Sasha and then Libby for uh, anything that you might want to add. Sounds great. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Katitza Rodriguez. I'm the policy director for global privacy at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And for me, there is no definitive understanding of the term. I believe there are many concepts of metaverses, but one possible future now prominent in many conversations is one version of that metaverse. The term, the term metaverse comes from Neil Stephenson's 1992 novel, Snow Crash, which imagined a single worldwide VR environment with its virtual reality, real estate controlled by this powerful single entity, the Global Multimedia Protocol Group. In the novel's metaverse, this is envisioned as a heavily gated institutionalized inequity with the disfranchised having low resolution avatars and subject to social stigma. This is not the metaverse that we want to see, and it doesn't need to be. I refuse to follow dystopias. I believe we can build upon the interested ideas that have come before us to have a more diverse metaverse and inclusive metaverse. I strongly believe there is no need to be a single metaverse, nor that any metaverse needs to be owned or controlled by a single entity. Indeed, one way to think of the metaverse is a generic term for the space in which a vast array of different decentralized and interoperable VR and augmented reality services exist and interact. Decentralization was a key feature of the early internet, a network of networks which have been continually centralized over the last few decades. We have seen problems with single point of control or single point of failures, a wall garden that seriously enforces its ambition environment may be attractive to some stakeholders. 
but it's best to have a choice and be able to move freely between the environments you visit. We don't want to be locked out or locked in. We can instead imagine a world of words like the internet network of networks that allows anyone at any point to interact effectively and with their users intact. Interoperability will be key, for example, allowing you to keep a consistent avatar across all your different platforms for each way you want to present, which is subject to your own control and not tied to a single provider. Interoperability enables competition so users can effectively decide what environment works best for them. I, have, I, have, I think it's important that when we talk about the metaverses or the interoperable metaverses, we could keep thinking on nurturing the grassroots, right respecting technology being developed today. And governments need to pay more attention to big tech companies so they don't take all over all the competitors before other companies have a chance to re develop right respecting technology to dominant surveillance, surveillance driving platforms. That's all, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Katitza. And Sasha, Libby, anything to, to add on your perspective? I think I think Katitza um really eloquently and, and beautifully described um the metaverse. I don't I don't think I have a lot to add. Um, and I totally agree with everything that's been said. The one aspect that I find very interesting about the idea of, of a metaverse, of, of sort of like a, a unified idea of a metaverse is, um, you know, right now when we think about our online experiences, they're very, um, you know, kind of compartmentalized. So we go to one place on the internet to bank, right? And we go to another place on the internet to socialize with our friends and we go to a third place maybe to find news. Um, and so the idea that I kind of take away is also, um, this is a place where we do everything in one environment, just as we do in real life, right? You go outside, you walk down the street, there's your bank, there's your friend, there's your coffee shop. Um, and so it's 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 not only um, kind of making the things that we do online virtual, but also creating a space where all of those things are present at once, which, um, you know, I think presents actually interesting privacy issues and, and interesting expectations of um, of consumers and you know players in in this world as they sort of navigate the different um, uh, kind of context that they're operating in. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with um, with what Libby and Katita said. Um, one uh, sort of small uh, point I wanted to make is the short answer really is we don't know what the metaverse is because we haven't really built it yet, so right? So like, so, so far we have these, you know, seeds that we're, we're imagining will blossom into some sort of a tree, um, but a lot of it is what we make of it and, and how we decide on both on policy front and, and the technology front, um, how is it gonna look like? And this is what makes it exciting um, and or terrifying, depending who you ask. Um, so so that just, I want, just wanted to make that clear. Yeah, we have an idea of what it could be, we don't know yet really because it doesn't exist yet um i just for a second I, as i was mulling this over I, I thought that you know we probably know more about black holes than we do about the metaverse even though we haven't seen one so um this is something to just kind of think about that you know there's still time to define just like you know at the days of the early internet we defined sort of the principles and the ideas the philosophy behind it I think this is a good time to to think about these things now and to have those conversations now, um, as opposed to just defaulting to what the internet currently is, which is very different from what the internet was in the 90s, let's say. Thank you so much for sharing your um, ideas around the metaverse. Um, we had uh, a, an event last week that discussed uh, what is metaverse uh, in general, and also um, all the speakers shared very different understandings around what it means and how it came about and where we want to take it. Um, but now turning to more legal uh, issues around the metaverse, uh, we'll turn to Libby. And the um, question is, what kinds of legal frameworks or issues 
do you think are relevant to the metaverse and its implications? Well, that, that's a very broad question. I mean, you know, in general, every legal flame framework that we expect to apply online should theoretically apply, um, you know, in, in the metaverse. I think that, um, you know, obviously my expertise, I, I practice in the privacy space for kind of, I think, framing the discussion around privacy, if we, if we kind of focus that way. Um, you know, it's an, it's an interesting question, um, because I think there's two, there's two aspects to think about. One is, okay, so we have a set of, you know, privacy laws and regulations that already apply to various sectors, um, at least if we're thinking about the U.S., right, to start. And then there are um, global privacy laws that apply. And, though, and the laws that exist right now, you know, don't really, I, I don't know if they necessarily fully don't contemplate the idea of a metaverse. I think that they're built to be flexible or have intentions to be flexible. Um, but I think it's, you know, I think Sasha made this point, but like it's difficult to say what's going to apply because we have no idea really what the metaverse is going to look like when it um when and if it kind of comes to fruition in a way that we're all uh fluent with at the time but in the u.s you know one of the things that sort of strikes me as as challenging is kind of going back actually to what i was i was saying earlier is that this is going to be perhaps you know one environment that deals with a number of different sectors and the way the U.S. generally thinks about privacy today and like huge asterisk, like there's a lot of stuff coming down the pike, like who knows if we'll be having the same conversation a, a year or two from now. But right now, the U.S. treats, you know, privacy generally as um, sector specific. So, you know, financial privacy regulations, health privacy regulations, um, uh, children's privacy regulations. And I think it becomes challenging to apply those legal frameworks when the um, kind of boundaries around those worlds or around that data is removed. Um, so if your bank, again, like also becomes your social media platform, um, I think that, you know, those legal frameworks still need to be uh, kind of stretched to fit the reality of the, of the world that you're living in. But I, I will say again, like, I don't know that that's necessarily um, impossible, right? We're seeing, I think, flex already. And I think that, you know, there's there are social apps that have um, financial aspects to them. And there are, um, I think, more uh, blurred lines between what we're expecting um, your our internet experience to be like. And I think that's just kind of a, a pathway to what this broader expectation is um, of kind of a, a virtual experience. Um, so I know that's not like fully answering your direct question, but I think that I think the reality is like there's nothing special about the metaverse when it comes to applying privacy laws. I think that it will be um, the same exercise that we as privacy professionals have engaged in time and time again as technology evolves, right? I mean, I practice a lot in um, children's, the children's privacy space, and that COPPA is a law that was drafted, you know, in the 90s, it was revised once in 2013, but generally speaking, it's not, um, it wasn't written with the, obviously with, you know, social media today in mind or the way that kids interact with the internet. That doesn't mean that it, that the legal framework needs to be changed or that it, um, you know, it, it doesn't apply today, but it constantly needs kind of reinterpretation and updated guidance. And I think that that's just kind of um, going to continue as technology shifts and our virtual worlds become more rich. Awesome, thank you. And uh, Sasha Katitsa, do you have anything to, to add on that? Um, yeah, and I could add a little bit more on some aspects. I agree with Libby that, um, you know, uh, there are many as well, I probably prefer to talk about extended reality than metaverse because metaverse could be very wide and can include NFTs and other issues, but it's still, um, uh, we don't have all the technology, but I think many of the laws that already exist will be applicable to many aspects 
on the metaverse, like data protection, collection of personal data, will be part of that debate in Europe, the GDPR, but there will be new challenges. For instance, all the collection of the inferences of your data coming from your data, from your biometrics, from your eyes, from your bodies, you know, and whether that is considered biometric under the law or not, or whether uh, what should be, even if it's not, the level of the highest level of protection of that data, what should be the level of protection of this type of data. And there are many of these legal questions that will need to be popped up as technology evolve. Um, but one of the topics uh, that I personally have been uh, examining, exam analyzing, and that I'm passionate about is um, the government use of government surveillance in the context of extended reality. And it's another aspect of privacy, it's privacy vis-a-vis -vis the government, which is related also to consumer privacy, because the more companies collect data about users, the more uh, uh, information is available to governments. So in this context of government surveillance, right now with the different devices um, that already exist, and I'm talking about just traditional phone, tablets, laptops, and more and more are becoming smart, are becoming connected. We are talking, we are already face a golden age of surveillance with all the internet of things and wearable devices who are also doing egocentric collection of data of your body. It's the, 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 head, the sensors are not looking at what you see, but they are looking at you, at your heartbeats, at your eyes, at your are your body, are your body reactions to stimuli, and not only the reactions that you do voluntarily, unconsciously, but also these unconscious voluntary reactions to the body. And so, um, and I will, but I do believe that extended reality holds the potential to take that to the next level um, in terms of uh, intrusive surveillance. Developers have ambition uh, VR environments that provide, and, it, and it's great, don't get me wrong, I love VR and I really hooked into being in these worlds, but they provide, for instance, a photorealistic model of your home. And so you can invite your VR users over what to look, how your, your living look, your living uh, room will look like. And so they are create a three D model of your home, and it will be like a, a real, rep, a real three D representation of your home with whatever is inside your living room, your books or whatever you left there. How organized is who this how this organized is, um, and they will use it for good things. You can invite a friend who is distance to let teleport on your home, and and you can play games and you can do things. And that's one of the aspects. But unlike your real life living room, all the details of your private space will be recorded, will be digitalized and transferred to another person over the wire. So from a government surveillance perspective, if we don't have the strong protection, each of these bits can be intercepted or stored for later analysis. So we need strong, sufficient details. This contains a record of your books on your, like our 3D map of our home will record uh, what books I have on my shelf, which papers or documents I'm signing on my coffee table, which art I have on my walls. A search that mimics the police in your home without even the necessary notice that come from police officers knocking on your door. So they can just tell the transport that they can see, have access, but they police will knock at your door and tell you, this is a warrant. We, that's why we need, we must ensure a future where government still needs a warrant to look into your virtual home, regardless of where the data is stored. And that's important. Not because it's just your digital representation of your home, this needs to have a lower level of protection. And that's one key thing. When we talk about, and that's why I like to talk more about augmented reality or XR, or VR, because each of them have different legal explications and even within them, different apps with different legal and policy implications. But when we talk about AR, 
uh, AR also has some risk when it comes to government surveillance. Um, as you know, uh, augmented reality will be become and smart glasses, especially if they become popular, will become part of interaction as you walk down a public street. And many visions of AR include tools to get visual, audio, and a spatial mapping of everything around you. It's like creating a, a life map of all the places where you go. Um, if this becomes very popular, and we have some examples like Pokemon Go, et cetera, you know, but if this, everyone's using their smart, smart um, glasses and digitalizing not only public spaces, but semi-public spaces too, or even at your home, you can imagine a public event, perhaps a political rally or a protest when dozens or maybe hundreds of AR glasses are there in the crowd. And if this data is stored, it creates a time machine for the police to be able to access it. So the authorities could take all the data and pull themselves in the crowd, looking around at who is in that process in that moment. If there are enough augmented reality cameras, angles, um, a virtual time traveler from the government can walk around and listen to conversations and collect evidence on the AR user and all the bystanders who never agree to be part of this kind of future. So that thing, it's important to start thinking on this aspect of privacy as equal as other aspects that are also very important in the discussion. And XR technology can do, do much more, you know. For instance, it can include um, deeply biometric information collection for your body. There is discussion whether it's biometric or not, but it's uh, data that reveals um, data that comes from your eyes, your bodies, your heartbeats, and the inferences that it reveals. And that's important. For instance, uh, some companies would like to do animating avatars and make more nuanced um, uh, and real expressions into virtual conversations and make it fun. But it can also, and I, I like to think how the government will think on these issues, it can be, be used to speculate away about your state of mind too. Of course, there is a lot of snake like all here. I, as we discussed, there is the, technolo the technology is not there. That's the promises of some of the, the people who are in the space of what they want the technology to do. But the technology could actually not work, but, but if it works, it's worrisome in either way. If it does learn about your inner feelings, uh, your predictions, even before you are conscious about that, it's a huge invasion of privacy that can force you to testify against yourself and against your will. So immunity, privilege are something that we need to discuss in this space to make sure the government, and we have the safeguards embedded in law or are applicable in this context. Um, if the government gets the analysis wrong, a government make, may make an unwarranted assumptions about you during the dystopian predicting policing we were warned in minority report, and we don't want that. Just to conclude, you know, human rights are vital, whether you are in virtual world or emerging reality. We need to be able to take advantage of XR. I'm still positive with, I really want this technology to succeed, but we should do it in a way where we are not sacrificing our fundamental rights. Be right back. The Internet Law and Policy Foundry's 2022 Policy Hackathon is the Foundry's third Policy Hackathon, happening this October 14 through 16. The Policy Hackathon is a three-day event that brings together creative technical and policy professionals from around the world to tackle emerging and long-standing problems related to the intersection of law, policy, and technology. The theme of this year's hackathon is privacy, trust, and safety in the metaverse. Additionally, the Foundry is holding a writing competition and a series of virtual events about all things metaverse. For more information about the hackathon, the writing competition, and other hackathon-related events, you can visit the Foundry's website, ilpfoundry.us, 
or our social media pages. So Libby and Katitza mentioned a lot of different challenges uh, around, um, you know, metaverse, be that, in, you know, in terms of the rights of the child or government access to data or, you know, biometric data collection and whatnot. Um, so I would love to turn to Sasha and ask, uh, ask you what, um, what would you envision? What kind of safeguards would you, would you want to have in place so that we have a more privacy uh, sensitive and privacy protective uh, virtual spaces. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I, first I wanted to kind of address a, a couple of things too about like, so the st status quo scenario right now is that, you know, as pretty much uh, most people involved in the privacy community uh, would know that we have a lot of work to be done as far as you know, even existing mobile apps, right? The world of um, where, you know, I think there was a study that uh, most children targeted apps were collecting some data that they weren't supposed to be collecting. I think a few years back, there was a, there was a study about that. Um, my point is that uh, in the current status quo, there's a, a lot of unsolved uh, issues about the notice and consent. And I think it would be not wise to, to transfer, to kind of take those frameworks and to keep running with them in, in the metaverse or wh whatever that means, right? So whether it's in VR, AR, um, XR, et cetera. Um, so it's kind of like, that's about the status quo at that point. Um, a more hopeful scenario, um, I think, is where we can view these discussions about uh, what metaverse looks like and what it can be to serve as a catalyst for us to envision what kind of things we want to see, um, you know, as far as regulations and laws, because law is always, the law is always behind technology. And so by having these discussions, maybe that will catalyze the laws to catch up more, um, as we've seen, you know, with the Age Appropriate Design Act. So AADC is a, is a UK law that had it not been for some privacy violations of some companies prior, it probably wouldn't have taken effect. So, so there's a catch up effect. And so uh, unfortunately, it takes us to break things, uh, you know, to, to fix them uh, later uh, with regulations. But to answer your question, um, about about you know, what sort of technologies, perhaps privacy enhancing technologies we can um, use. I think, well, first of all, we have to, what's the kind of uh, technical and legal framework with which we approach building uh, these systems, right? Uh, are we going to emphasize privacy by design? Are we going to be as um, diligent as, you know, some players um, in the tech space are about it? Um, so I would think, you know, differential privacy or, um, you know, in introducing some noise into the data to uh, anonymize um, the, the data that we collect from various people. Because, I mean, let's face it, if it's a, if, it, if the um, metaverse will be big enough and, and simultaneous enough, there will be, it'll be very difficult to distinguish between borders and countries. And, and so the, the jurisdictional element becomes very hard to enforce. So, um, I think the closer we come to anonymity, uh, of course, then there's a trade-off of the usefulness of the metaverse. You know, the, I'm sure there'll be players who will insist on folks using their real names, uh, you know, et cetera, and, and not being anonymous from the abuse standpoint. So there are ways I think we can just carry over as far as what we do now to make um, the user experience more private, um, uh, so that they're not de-anonymized, de uh, but it will be more challenging because, again, there are more data point um, entries, and so we just there's just so much more data in the metaverse that will be collected about someone, and and uh, some say it'll be easier to de-identify someone in the metaverse because there are just so many points and and unique points like uh, your voice inflection, your you know, uh, the, your mannerisms. You can infer a lot of data about about people. Um, and so it will be challenging. I mean, uh, uh, how do you mask yourself? You know, uh, if everything about you is scanned, if everything about you walk, the way you walk and talk is scanned, will we need some sort of disguises to, to enter the, the metaverse? I, I don't know. I mean, a lot of it is still to be developed, but I think the key point is we need to keep thinking about it um, and not just kind of be focused on the on the maybe benefits or the or the commerce side of things but um, keeping privacy central is always I think key so um, we need to keep that in mind 
Thanks so much, Sasha. And definitely, I agree. There is a lot to be done even today. Uh, but I'd love to turn to Libby to see if she has anything to add uh, about safeguards. Um, I mean, I feel like I'm a, a broken record a little bit, but you know, I do think this is a space where we're going to have to see how things evolve. You know, um, I think that one thing that we're not sure about is what consumers' expectations will be, right? Um, and and Katitza, when you were talking, this sort of uh, jog something, you know, in, in my mind about some of the precedent around, um, you know, creating like a, a safe haven around a home. Right and and special privacy rights around protected spaces in the physical world, um, and there's a, a reasonable expectation of privacy in in certain places. Right in a telephone booth, in your in one's home, in the sanctity of a marriage. These are all kind of specific examples from the Supreme Court, but it's it's not clear to me today whether um, the general consensus is that those expectations of privacy persist in the virtual world. Um, you know, if we design a home in the metaverse that is exactly, you know, pixel by pixel what our house looks like here, I, that, you know, that's one side of the coin, right? Because that's like, yeah, that should perhaps be given the same protections and afforded that kind of special status. But what if, you know, your neighbor down the street makes like a clown house and it looks like a big mushroom and obviously looks nothing like what he has right at home. So are those two people given the same privacy protections around the space that they're kind of virtually living in? How do we differentiate? You know, is it that kind of to Sasha's point, is it that you just put in place privacy by design um, kind of protections that instruct users not to reveal, you know, personally identifiable information or, you know, kind of and not even personally identifiable, but just kind of personal in the colloquial sense, right? Just about your your life. Um, and I think I think that, that will evolve over time. You know, I think that the expectations of, of privacy online have really evolved over time. And, you know, we've seen, I think, uh, a lot of attention towards practices that maybe were considered innocuous or commonplace five years ago, you know, now they're being referred to more and more as commercial surveillance by the FTC, um, you know, big kind of um, focus on targeted advertising, which is sort of the way the internet, you know, evolved and thrived. Um, so it's just, I, I think this is all going to be iterative and I know that's not a satisfying answer, but I, I think that it's not, um, it's not apparent and I, it's, it's not clear what individuals will expect when they're moving around in a virtual world. Is it going to be closer to the expectations we have when we traverse the internet, which are, I think, lower than when you're going about your day in your physical body? Or will it be closer to what we expect when we're driving around in our car and going from place to place, um, you know, and have this, you know, kind of expectation of surveillance um, or, you know, spaces where we expect a higher degree of privacy, especially from government intrusion. I think that that's, that I think remains to be seen. I'm sure there are really smart people thinking about it already, but, um, you know, it's not, I don't think that's kind of set in stone yet. Yeah, thank you, Libby, for digging into that potential judicial uh, interpretation of a reasonable expectation of privacy in this metaverse context. I want to dig uh, more into the potential legislative response to the metaverse from that privacy perspective and ask, what are some of the, the implications that we could see on the legislative uh, side in consideration of how um, privacy as a whole uh, is evolving, how might the metaverse be taken into account in the future? Um, and so we'll start with Sasha and then go to Katitza and then Libby. Yeah, I think uh, echoing, uh, you know, a few comments ago of what, what Libby was saying, um, uh, I think as of now, we've seen a lot of movement on the children's privacy front. Um, I think we're seeing uh, an effort, uh, finally, for the U.S. to have uh, an omnibus uh, privacy 
legislation. I'm not sure if it will succeed, um, but the fact that there is more grassroots support for, for this, uh, I think that's a great sign. Um, it definitely, it, the landscape has changed for the past 10 years uh, as far as how Americans think of privacy, and that's really important. Um, so I think a lot of things as of right now, um, in the U.S. at least, it's just following the California example. So you see laws that are focused uh, on biometric privacy, laws that are mostly also consumer focused, some of them you know, weaker than the uh, California, some of them have different aspects of it. Um, so, so you see it definitely a mixed bag, but at least the momentum is there, uh, at least on a statewide level, to enact some consumer protections. Um, as far as you know, how that will affect the metaverse, um, I think it will in a way, because you know, if you have stronger protections and, and consumers know about their rights to delete, rights to correct, right to know, um, that mindset, I think that building the, the sort of the soft power to know that you have those rights is really important because then, uh, back to Libby's point, that consumer expectations are being shaped right now um, as, as far as how we use websites um, and apps. So it, it matters a lot. And I think um, indirectly it will affect the metaverse in the future. Um, but the momentum, I think, is there, at least on the statewide level and now federally, too. Um, I am excited, but personally, because of the child privacy is really important uh, to me. And I think it's it's great uh, as far as what we're doing, um, uh, like the Illinois, um, uh, the um, BIPA, you know, the um, biometrics law. It's very important. A lot of other states are looking at it. Um, and I think also because we are a more connected world, we're seeing the downfalls. So we're seeing the bad case scenarios around the world where surveillance is state based. It's not just, you know, commercial surveillance and we're seeing those dangers. And I think that's motivating uh, some of the impetus for change too. So um, I think it's good. I think uh, we're more tuned in to uh, the black mirror scenarios of, of, of what, you know, uh, not having privacy can look like. And that I think is a big driver too of legislative change. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about the, the regulations in the U.S. Ah, with social media. So people are becoming more conscious of their privacy and should be able to choose which companies they trust with their information, especially information as sensitive as the data collected by the XR headsets that will need it for the metaverse. Companies should recognize this responsibility this inherently in this egocentric collection of this very sensitive data and that they must be held accountable for actions that break that trust. And I think whatever legislation will come, I think at the core of it, and I hope will be the strong protection for these biometric inferences and to ensure that the data is not used to harm individuals against myself, to discriminate me, to use my data for other company to, to use it against me. And so we want the data for benefit of society, for benefit of ourselves. If these wearables or AR XR headsets are telling me things about my health that are good for me, uh, that's great. But if then they're using it to for other purposes that are not for my benefit, then uh, that shouldn't happen, or that should be should, should happen in a way that it's uh, with due process and and safeguards to ensure that that data is not abused and that that data won't won't hurt the user. And it's very hard to talk in a very general terms, uh, not only because of the different applications and different business models, but also because application of privacy principles in a specific, specific context are challenging too and complex. Uh, but I think as a general term and matter, XR will collect more sensitive data, more biometric data, more intimate data that have not been collected before and that start being collected. And that data needs a higher level of protection. I believe and I hope companies have learned the lessons for everything that goes wrong on the internet and right with social media. And we need to apply these lessons now to ensure that everyone can take advantage of these technologies and that the metaverse and, and the metaverse without sacrificing our human rights. And I'm also a broken record, keep repeating the same. 
Most importantly, companies should commit to provide the strong level of protections, and this should come from the companies on this sensitive data they collect and what they infer from that. A sensitive data, personal data revealed ethnics or racial, political opinions, religious or philosophical belief, or the processing of genetic data, biometric data, data coming from their body, data concerning health or data concerning uh, natural person sex life or sexual orientation, to put some examples. Yes, the future is tomorrow. Yes, the, the technology is being developed but let's make it now a future we want to live in. Through a strong policy, robust transparency, wise course, modernized laws, and privacy by design engineering, we can and should have the metaverse we would like to live in. Last year on December 10, International Human Rights Day, EFF and Access Now, another international organization, issue a little of uh, recommendations about human rights in the metaverse. And we make recommendations also for investors. Um, and we ask investors to start evaluating their portfolios to determine whether they may be investing in XR technologies and use their leverage to ensure that those portfolios, companies adhere to human rights standards in the development and deployment of XR. And we have many others you, on there. You can check it out on the website. But we also call on companies to publicly pledge to require governments to get the necessary legal process to access the data, to notify users when allowed by law, regular, regularly publish transparency reports, utilize encryption without backdoors, and fight to limit data that can be accessed do what is necessary, adequate, and proportionate. And we want companies to pledge that and say, this I will stand on privacy. Privacy is my mark, is my competitive advantage. And I will show it by concretely defending privacy in courts, defending privacy in Congress, and instead of anti-privacy legislation or other anti-privacy move. Um, there you can see more on our website, but thank you for the opportunity to share my views. Thank you, Katitza. And Libby, anything to add before we move on to our last question of the moderated portion of the discussion? I will just like very, very quickly add my perhaps cynical thoughts, which is I actually don't think that legislation is going to address what we're talking about today. I think that legislation moves at a snail's pace and is reactive. Um, that's just sort of the reality that we're living in. And I think um, there is you know, a, a concerted and strong effort for federal privacy legislation right now. I'm not entirely hopeful that that's going to get necessarily the traction that it needs to become law. Um, but even if it does, I don't, I don't think we'll be in a place where it's going to contemplate or address the metaverse you know, as it as it exists kind of in our heads. And then once it's actually a reality, you know, it, I, I, it's just, I think there's way too many moving pieces for the pace that legislation moves at. Um, so I think it will have to be addressed through, you know, um, interpretation, guidance and enforcement. Thank you, Libby. Um, so to close out this uh, moderated part of the discussion. We have one last question. And we already discussed many different challenges around privacy in the metaverse and also some of the safeguards that uh, all three of you and also all of us would love to see in this virtual world. Um, and the last question that we want to ask you is, how do you imagine the future of the metaverse? And what specific steps would you want uh, to take moving forward from this place that we are right now, so that we try to overcome those challenges and also make the most out of the opportunities that these virtual worlds offer us. Uh, and I would love to start with uh, Katica, then go to Libby and then to Sasha. Thank you, Mary. I will be brief, but I think uh, I already mentioned, I strongly believe there is no need to be a single metaverse, nor does any metaverse need to be owned or controlled by a single entity. We want a decentralized metaverse and interoperable VR and AR services. 
um, that's uh, very key. I would love to have a strong legal protection, legal, technical, because technical is equally important. Um, um, even uh, corporate social responsibility principles strongly apply, especially in the collection of biometric inferences or data coming from your body. Um, I think that ignoring that will create even more harms that happen with social media. And I think that ignoring that or trying to minimize its risk, it won't be productive going forward for the development of the metaverse. I think this is one of the crucial things. Uh, I also agree with many of the speakers before that um, I personally don't think um, you need just one single law. I think there will be many laws applicable to different contexts and uh, aspects. Metaverse is a very vague term, so legislating metaverse for me doesn't make sense. Uh, there will be, um, for instance, some of the XR technology is very similar to virtual assistants and some wearable devices. And so just having like a single kind of type of technology regulated, I don't know if that makes sense from, not from a civil society perspective, just from a drafting legislation perspective, you know? And so I will, uh, I think we need in the United States, um, I came from other countries. So the United States is one of the few countries in the world who does not have a federal or comprehensive data protection legislation. There are more than 100 uh, countries who have one, even my country in Peru have one. And so I grew up comparing data protection laws and the courts, and the constitutional courts have developed the right for many years. So for me, uh, it's very difficult to understand that we are still discussing about drafting one, but uh, I think that should be a given. And I, well, we don't know if necessarily will be a good data protection law or not. And I hope the U.S. Uh, can do that and, uh, and can um, and get some of the legislation. I don't think the data protection law will fix all the problems. Um, just with, if you start analyzing the GDPR, there are complexities in the interpretation of the GDPR now. And especially even in the context of XR, and especially in the context of this body data biometrics for the purpose of identification. Um, so I think there will be more discussions. The EU is working on the Artificial Intelligence Act. We have to see how that will be applied in this context too. And I see like different parts of different legislations be applied. But if we talk about metaverse, that's too big. I agree that I don't think it makes sense that legislation for the metaverse. As I said, um, regulating one single technology and it's, it's like that doesn't make sense. There will be different aspects, um, financial privacy, etc. So, yeah, that's my my opinion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Katita. Libby. Yeah, I um, I think that we've we've talked a, a lot about this already, and I think the only thing that I would return to, you know, is um, I I wouldn't approach. I agree. This is, it's such a vague term and I feel almost silly saying like the metaverse as if it's like going to be like a door that we open. But I, I, I think that there's no reason to approach the metaverse as anything different than technology that's evolved over time. You know, I, I'm sure that like when we were talking about the internet, everyone was trying to guess as to like, you know, how we would apply the existing sets of rules and regulations to this evolving new technology that no one really wrapped their head around. If, you know, the quote unquote metaverse is as transformative as many believe that it will be, then the we sort of return to basics, right? And from a privacy perspective, those are the privacy by design principles that have been, um, you know, they're, they're at this point, I think like 30 or 40 years old, they're not new and they have evolved over time, I think flexibly and well suited to um, many different types of technologies and, and contexts. So, you know, offering consumers choice, um, you know, meaningful choice over the type of data that's collected. Like not, none of this is new, but, you know, obviously transparency and there are issues of course with, um, with those um, kind of foundational principles as well. But um, I, I think that the privacy protections that I would hope to see in any evolution of a metaverse um, that that comes about is uh, really no different than what we expect in um, any new technology that that we see come come around, right? 
um, especially one that is so um, consumer centric in the sense that your whole self would be um, would be involved. I think it's just going to be, and you know, and maybe the difference that 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 I would hope for is um, really having the industry be part of the discussion with policymakers um, and and regulators because. You know, I think we're at a point right now where there's such a great disconnect um, between the industry and between where where regulators and policymakers are. And it seems that the gap has gotten only wider over time. Um, and, and to have something like this succeed, there needs to be a real conversation about the benefits to consumers and, you know, how the, the virtual world can enable access, um, you know, and, and, and um, improve equality. Um, and, and that I think needs to be part of the discussion when we're thinking about, you know, countervailing harms and benefits, um, to the users who will be engaged in this world. Thank you so much, Libby and Sasha. Yeah, I'll be brief because I, I know we're a little tight on time. Um, I just wanted to say that, um, it's, in my personal view, what metaverse will look like will be determined largely by who gets to the market first with it. I think that's been true of most technologies, you know, including social media, a video, others. And with that, we have to be cautious thinking of, of it that way, um, because as of now, it is very difficult for small players to get to the market. Um, you know, the large uh, tech companies do have a lot of sway in, into what becomes the leading technology, whether it's the acquiring or funding uh, various startups. So I think how I imagine the metaverse to look like is largely dictated by who gets to the market with it first. They, they dictate the ethos. They, they sort of build the expectations also. Um, and that, that is, it could be scary depending who, who this is. So the solution to that is, to try to have some sort of a standards uh, effort uh, to have you know um, organizations get together and decide what the standards of it should be, and so that it's not just dictated by one large, uh, powerful entity. Um, I think that's the point. I think we need to um, keep in mind. So it's not just through legislation, but also through. Um, an effort on the standard side. Uh, also education, I think that that's also important. If we educate consumers uh, about these dangers, I think a standards effort is more likely as well. Thank you so much, everyone. And now I wanna get into some questions from our audience. Um, so first, uh, a really interesting question here that brings in the cybersecurity aspect um, of all this. And so the question is, is it possible that a lack of privacy can bring at the same time a sense of security uh, within this metaverse context? Any thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, I think the, I see the example in the chat is, you know, surveillance cameras. Um, and I think that's the best example is surveillance for the sake of improving security. Um, and and there's I think there are there are examples in the digital world where there are a lot of carves out, carve outs for fraud protection, for example, right? So um, many privacy laws that restrict, the user sharing of information have exceptions for things like fraud prevention, um, and um, and similarly to kind of like secure your rights and the rights of the service or or, or similar obligations. So I I do think there is um, yeah I think there's a balance between privacy and security. I don't necessarily think that they're intention though, um, because. I, I think the way that I see that type of security is different than um, what we generally think of as, you know, the, like a cybersecurity um, program, which generally doesn't need to compromise privacy um, with, you know, strong technical, technical and administrative safeguards. Um, 
that so I I think I I I take the premise. I'm just I'm not sure there's a direct conflict other than like perhaps some you know narrow um, narrow cases. Petita, please go ahead. Oh, you're you're uh, muted. Thank you for the reminder. I agree that privacy and security does not need to be in conflict, um, but um, having a lot of cameras out in the city and live in a, in a society where you are consciously surveilled and the data is centralized and someone can remote go to that database, uh, uh, it, it's creating a time machine of real surveillance in real time that will be more broader than just even the just cameras in the streets. Um, I think that creating that database creates a lot of security risk um, for people who can access that data and how can use it in different ways. Uh, security becomes like a honeypot for law enforcement to have access to that data. So there could be risk. It doesn't mean uh, we don't need to have AR or smart glasses. We just need to think about how to do it in a way that does not create these harms. Uh, and I think the conversation is still very early. In, 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 there are conversations even about notification to users that you are being recorded, for example. But what happens is these glasses put more powerful technology like face recognition, you know? Yeah, there are a lot of discussions about having cameras with face recognition in the streets, which EFI has opposed when the government has um, implemented them. Uh, What's happening if the company does it? We talk about notice and consent, uh, but on um, purpose limitation, I think a notice consent was criticized by one of the speakers for not being effective, but um, I agree that have been very hard to implement, but I think if we read all the principles together as a whole, like purpose limitation, et cetera, they might provide some protection, so at least, uh, but it creates a lot of um, risk um, for law enforcement to use these for, for other purposes uh, in a way that you know, really change society as a whole. So, uh, and notification is hard to make, uh, you know, and there will be, a, that's why I don't think legislation will be able to solve everything. I think legislation is important, but for instance, there are a lot of trade off on this issue. Uh, for instance, notification to users, notifications that you are recording someone will the by bystander, how you will get cons effective informed consent from the bystander when you're recording that. Um, and some companies are thinking about it. And, uh, uh, what do you do when your hardware, you know, the battery goes off? Could you keep telling the user that you are recording them or you will prioritize the battery? Um, and that many choices people will make. Um, so I think if, uh, notice and consent inform is still very important and they need to figure out a way to do it, especially when it comes to bystanders. Um, but not only those principles, there are also purpose limitation, security, encryption, and many other technical and legal protections. Great, so for our last audience question, I wanna take us to a practical note. Um, so this question is, what can individuals using AR, uh, extended reality or VR technologies do in their personal lives to protect their own data? And maybe this can be like a 30 second rapid fire from each of you before we close out. I'll, I'll just kind of repeat a little bit of the education part. Join online forums that discuss privacy. There's a, a lot of smart people out there who read TAS for fun <laughs> and will tell you uh, what to look out for, um, what you should consent to, what you should be more careful about, read things yourself, obviously. Um, I think being more proactive about your own privacy will go a long way. I think that's a perfect note to end on. I don't have anything that could be better said. I think take you know take control and be an active player in your own privacy controls. I think privacy controls are important, but won't be enough. And I will say that it's very hard for the users to understand how their data is being processed in the background. 
uh, you can set the, your settings, but how the inferences on how uh, how they're processing your data and the inferences that are making to them and how that inference is being used and whether it's used on your benefits or against you is something that even it will be very hard. There is a lot of uh, discussions about how to make that more transparency or more transparent, whether that's possible or not, or whether that could go, um, confuse users even more because it's so complex, even for privacy professionals, that even the user will have a hard time to be able to know how it works and how to make many meaningful choices. Uh, but it's really important and we need to figure out a way. And, uh, I always said, you know, you have to, uh, nerd harder on privacy and figure out new ways of putting equal money in investments on new privacy tools to make sure that we are not only telling users their choices and basic choices, but we are also making more transparent, um, transparent what's happening in the background and how that data is protected. So we as users can trust companies that they are holding our data for our benefit and not against us. Well, with that, we will wrap up this discussion uh, to everyone tuning in. Thank you so much for joining us for the second event of our Policy Hackathon webinar series, uh, Privacy in the Metaverse. And be sure to check out the Internet Law and Policy Foundry on Twitter and LinkedIn for updates on upcoming events and activities. Uh, and registration for the hackathon is open now. So. Huge thank you to uh, Libby, Katitza, and Sasha for joining us, sharing your insights. Uh, this was a really fascinating conversation, really fascinating field. Um, can't wait to dive deeper into the metaverse. And thank you so much to Mary, a uh, wonderful co-moderator who uh, really led the charge in making uh, this event happen. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tech Policy Grind podcast. Be sure to check out the Foundry on LinkedIn and Twitter. And if you enjoyed this episode, leave us a review and give us a five-star rating. It really helps out the show. If you're interested in supporting the show, reach out to us at Foundry Podcasts at ilpfoundry.us. You can find our email in the show notes as well. You can see the full show notes and download the episode transcript for every episode on our website, ilpfoundry.us slash podcast. The Tech Policy Grind podcast comes out every Thursday. See you next time. The Tech Policy Grind podcast was created by the fellows at the Internet Law and Policy Foundry. It's produced and edited by me, Rima Musa, with support from the incredible Foundry Fellows. Special thanks to Lama Muhammad, our social coordinator, and Allison McReynolds, our accessibility coordinator, for all their help with this episode.